in someone who's a little bit more effective. Third, the data systems themselves are self-evident. But let me talk about this fourth area, turning around the lowest performing schools. We have failed for decades to do anything that really had a success, a track record of success in intervening in our worst performing schools. Those schools that when I was in high school were bad, are still bad here in D.C. today. Just that simple. And I can go to any city and you can name that school that's been bad, period. We've tinkered around the edges, but we've not found ways to actually have an impact. We know that the kind of strategies that we use have been poor. And we know that we need to think radically different about how to do it, and we won't have a lot of money to do it. We know that in these places, they tend to have huge variations in student current capability. Their current capacity and their current, uh, the, sorry, their current capacity and their current performance aren't actually meeting the needs and the teachers have too much of a range that they have to try and teach in order to be successful in the classroom. The only way to try and overcome those barriers, to provide the tools to teachers to allow them to be effective in that environment, and to allow the students to have access to the kind of resources in them for the time that they need it, is through technology. You are central to the four key strategies of our entire national education reform effort. Just that simple. Tackle on early childhood access and how we're going to affordably give access to the kids at the earliest ages to quality educational opportunities. And once again, multi-platform access for students in rural communities, in low-income communities, much more easily done with technology. So, as we said, it's not about now being on the side, it's about being core and frankly essential. And if your states have not recognized that, they will now. So with that, let's hear some uh, questions. We've got a few minutes for some dialogue. If, uh, if anyone is uh, interested to share a thought, ask a question, we'd be delighted to hear it. Please don't be shy. Yes, ma'am. So um, the report, I want to be really thoughtful about it. I want people to be thoughtful about what this report actually said. The report said that, yes, in fact, online learning is in some cases more effective, but the most effective is actually the blending of face-to-face -face and online learning. Um, and so I think that it does actually change the way we think about how we actually deliver instruction, how we follow up on instruction, and what actually the opportunity is for us to create, um, like I said before, do more with less. How do you create access for more students to your most effective teachers? And how do you reinforce what they're doing in ways that actually come back to the teacher with real information that helps them to do a better job in the classroom? I do think that's going to have an impact for the way that people think about using education technology dollars, and I know it will have a big impact on what you think about direct asking and guiding people to spend their education dollars, technology dollars. Frankly, not just education technology dollars, all the dollars. Yes, sir. My name is Doug Levin. I'm with the National Association of State Boards of Education. I'm quite fond of Delaware. <laughs> uh, uh, just from where you just laid out a very ambitious agenda, I think you'll find a lot of people in this room resonating to that agenda, find it very refreshing. Um, but it's tough to think about all that at once. So from where you sit, where do you think the really big points of leverage are that if we just fix that one thing, we'd see a lot of change quickly? I'm gonna let I'm gonna give Jim a minute to answer that, but let me let me share it from my vantage point. Data and analytics are the key, and the reason I say that I'll I'll make the following observation: If everyone in this room went to the local Best Buy to pick up a piece of electronics, if you looked at the computing power that went into that store manager's decision apparatus for how they ran various promotions. If the Redskins lose on Sunday and it's raining on Monday and I'm about to go drinking with the guys just before I have that, that hangout experience, they can run a promotion with me exactly targeted to what it would take to get me to buy a plasma TV. Ask yourself the following question. 
what data do we have on the educational experience in the classroom? Every school I visit, I come across a teacher who has some hybrid version of the content that he or she teaches in the class. That is, she or he grabs a lesson plan from a friend, puts together their own, combines it with a third uh, component, and all of that content is analog. It is known to them and their friends. There's no database that says physics as taught by Pat Wright versus physics as taught by Jim Sheldon and the portfolio of content that would go into that example. And that's just one modest example. If you think more holistically about data, as I said, we know more about retailing than we do about the educational experience. Despite the fact that we have data systems today that tell you the score the kid got, the teacher they had, and whether they're poor or not, which is if they're on reduced free and school lunch. Basically, kind of that's been the guts of our data system. So, that's my first step. Listen to, to Jim's comments of the infrastructure layer. Be very thoughtful about how you pull what you're, you're learning. So when the, when the reporter from the National Journal asks about whether online learning is better than in class, it's not a generic question like that. And it is, is Jim Shelton's version of how he or she taught uh, that particular course more effective in person or online? And we have more data to back up what works and what doesn't. That's my response. Well, of course you're right. <laughs> the, uh, the, the truth of the matter is that the very first thing that we can do to have the most impact is make better decisions. And right now, we're ill-equipped to make good decisions. So by putting in place the infrastructure to allow everyone, be it parents, be it stakeholders in the state government, be it teachers and students in the classroom to make better decisions, the more we turn out the data that allows them to do that, the more the system will propel itself. And that's one of the key things that I want us to actually focus on, is that although I'm a big believer in prioritization, I am very clear that there is no silver bullet. And so one of the most important things that we have to do, and which is one of the powerful lessons actually of this app competition, is figure out how do we turn loose the energy of the entire community to work on many, many things at once. And so let me give you an example of how one of the things I hope to do that will encourage this. So one of the ideas that, uh, that Anisha and I connected on that night was this idea of, I said, why isn't there an app store for the learning games? And he says, well, you know what I did in Virginia. I said, hey, I love that idea. Um, but why isn't every state in that game? Every state could do the same analysis and go through the data and say, hey, you know, we really have a problem with this. And it'd be great if people would focus on it. And it doesn't have to be about the math. It could be... Um, you know what? Our parent engagement really stinks. Why does parent engagement stink and why can't we come up with an app that actually sends out text messages to parents or whatever it is that is going to get them to have the information they need about their students, that's going to get them to respond the way they don't respond today? Or take your pick. Pick your issue. But if we had 50 states, prize, the top prize, all, all the credit in the world, all the reward in the world is deserved to you for winning. $5,000, but we can't come up with $5,000 to do things that are going to have a significant impact on our students' lives. Shame on us. So we could turn all 50 states loose on challenges that we're all facing, bring it into a community, and actually start to resolve issues with just a little bit of resources because we unleashed the power of the community. That is the lesson of our, our my children, your children, they know already. They don't look for what they know. They just throw it out there, and the world comes back to them with answers. Matt Nathan from T Shape. Uh, could you talk a little bit about your perspective on the role of technology and innovation in the Race to the Top program? That's all you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, a couple of things. One is that um, the, the details of Race to the Top are not public yet. What I will say is that. Um, uh, you can expect that part of the important thing in any competition about a race to the top is going to be how are you going to continue to do this when the government money runs out? And I already explained to you that I don't know how a state can explain that without explaining how technology fits in.